Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by the host of the Don't Give Up the Ship podcast. He is a retired Master Chief Petty Officer with 21 years in the submarine service. He is now focused on the professional and leadership development of enlisted sailors and military members through his podcast and online resources. Now, this is one of my go-to podcasts on leadership, and I am honored to have him join me on this show to talk about all things leadership. So welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. This is I, I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm honored to have a, a master chief on the show, our first master <laughs> chief in the, from the Navy and uh, and a former submarine or two. So uh, absolutely. It's great. Great to have you. Absolutely. I'm pumped. So let's uh, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, what you did. And then, I, and then tell us when you got this passion for uh, professional and leadership development. For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned it 21 years, uh, feels like five minutes and feels like a hundred years at the same time, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I, so I joined the Navy in 2000, I was 2002, but it was the September 11th attacks. Uh, we were talking a little bit before recording. I was a college student, September 11th happened that kind of, I was already looking at it, but it pushed me over the edge. Uh, and I joined the Navy because my dad and uh, brother, are both Navy vets, uh, brother was in at the time. So that was, it was just like, uh, the a confluence of all kinds of circumstances uh, led me to that. Spent 21 years in submarine service, three submarines, three shore duties, called it a day after a misadventure with cancer and anxiety and insomnia. That's a whole nother rabbit hole. You don't need to go down. But also I saw uh, I saw an opportunity to make the impact that I wanted to on active duty. There was a, I've had a whole bunch of listeners and supporters say, man, you should be a fleet master chief. You should be a force master chief. You should be the Mick Pond. And in my mind, I'm like, it doesn't matter if I was in those positions. I don't think I could affect the change that I can through the podcast. Uh, and the origin story there is uh, I was a chief at about 15 years uh, when I was an instructor uh, at the CSA school. And then I became the SEL there at the end. But I we kind of recognized the need. It wasn't just me. It was all the instructors. Uh, I started to hear all these stories about all these students reaching back, asking for leadership help. It wasn't, it wasn't like, how do I, how, how do I be a better CS? It was, how do I deal with this tyrannical LPO? Or I found myself based on like, uh, unplanned losses and, and unforeseen complications in a leadership position very rapidly. What do I do with my hands? And so a lot of instructors were like answering Facebook messages, answering emails constantly about the same types of things. And so was I. And so I was, I was looking for a, a mechanism where I could just direct them, hey, go to this resource. Um, and it, it, it didn't really exist at the time. And this was right around, this was, I, I started a, about 2016. So this is right as podcasts were starting to get popular. Um, and I was looking for something that I could do uh, without my face and name on it because I was still on active duty. And I thought it would be awkward if I, I got a following and then I was being like recognized at the exchange or something. Um, and I also had a big concern uh, about cre like having the credibility to get through to junior sailors because that was my target audience at the at the beginning um, was just shoot like E5 and below pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew him well enough to know that some chief with his face and name all on a podcast, like trying to sell themselves like a used car salesman immediately like I, you're not even gonna get past the link like you're just not going to listen. So I was like, this can't be about anything other than helping these people. Like mm. I, I needed to set it up in a way where you couldn't find a win for me. It wasn't an eval bullet. It wasn't a ego stroke. I wasn't making money off of it. Nothing. Um, and so that's why I was, <laughs> everybody gives me, gives me a hard time about it. Um, like the, I go by D guts. I don't put my name on it even to this day because it's not about me. That's not why I'm doing it. Uh, and I wanted to build that credibility with junior sailors over time. Um, so, and we settled on a podcast cause it was, I, I got to reach these kids where they are and I got to do it in that, in that way. So I wanted to reach them through their phones, like that appendage, like that's built into their hands. Now we're all cyborgs, but it's, it's, I can get them there. Um, and I can, they can listen to it while they're running. They can, you know, mm. like all the, uh, during a commute, whatever. But also I didn't want my face or name on it. So like YouTube's out it like automatically, I can't do like Instagram things or whatever. That's gotta be. And I, and I knew it would need to be long form as well. Like I would need time to work through a lot of these topics. So uh, I recorded the intro episode, sent it to a bunch of people I trusted, uh, like a kind of like a cross section, like junior sailors, former students, chiefs, uh, officers, and said, hey, is this a good idea or am I an idiot? And I just let the feedback come. And everybody universally was like, this is a good idea. 
it, it's a like, really <laughs> good idea. I, I remember I was, finding it and I was like, holy yeah. cow, this is because at the time you were still active duty and you're mm -hmm. telling you're basically helping, you know, uh, you know, so some junior sailors, more senior sailors, sailors that are transitioning into leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And you're you were just it was just really solid leadership advice and and not only just helping the sailors and helping uh, other military members, but just even myself as a leader, I was learning things from you in terms of leadership that I hadn't thought of. So it's, it's it was really a powerful thing. And, and you've got, you've been doing it for seven years. Is that right? Seven years. Yeah. I'm seven in year years. seven. Uh, yeah. I, and it's evolved a lot. Like, so I mentioned I was, I was targeting junior people. What I found as just a byproduct of my, Ident going through this process of identifying what I believe to be the issues and sailor feedback or, or like listener feedback, because they're not all sailors now nowadays. I got everybody, but um, it's they were asking me questions, and then I would I would analyze those things, talk about them, and what I found was I started to gain a pretty large following of chiefs, officers, and like the the board eligible senior ish first call classes, the ones that were starting to really consider, oh, I'm an LPO, I'm going to, I, you know, probably going to be a chief. And they were starting to like question their readiness and, and, or, or like first classes that don't have a chief, what do I do? How do I fill this gap and interact with the mess and all that stuff. So I very quickly uh, figured out that just like the issues that I'm talking about, like every, every sailor will tell you their, their biggest issue that they have on a daily basis is the byproducts of incompetent leadership. They're not going to articulate it exactly like that, but that's what they're going to be trying to convey. Um, and, and so I started talking a lot about chief stuff because again, like if I could fix anything in the Navy, it'd be the chief's mess. Uh, and we won't go down that rabbit hole. You can go listen to my podcast if you really <laughs> want to find out, but it's, uh, it's it's kind of like it's every E6 and below's biggest problem. It's probably every E7 and above's biggest problem. Um, and so by just by virtue of talking about that, it evolved into this audience of I I've got stacks of emails from chiefs saying like you reinvigorated me and taught me all these things and showed me ways of doing things I never entertained and and like I've had I literally have messages saying you changed my life, which blows mm -hmm. my mind every time it happens. But it's like it. it I didn't, I wasn't anticipating even having that audience. I, I had a lot of concern about like, um, and it's like imposter syndrome stuff, but like concerns that the chief's mess, like I would get a backlash because I criticize it a lot. Um, I, I admit we're doing a lot of things wrong and I, I include myself in that, right? I'm not, I'm far from perfect, but um, what, what I found was it was almost like there's this silent majority within the chief's mess that all kind of feel the same way. But when they look around the room in the mess, they're like assuming no one else does and that they're on an Island. But to hear me say it, they're just like, Oh, somebody else thinks the way I do. And it turns out a lot of people do like, I've never interacted with a chief petty officer active or retired that vehemently disagrees with what I'm saying. And I'm just the one that's willing to say it. Um, it seems. And so, yeah, it's, it's evolved quite a bit. Uh, it's super fun. I've learned so much. I'm a better communicator. I'm a better speaker. Um, I have connected with incredible people, including yourself. Like I was just on the phone with retired fleet mass chief, Paul Kingsbury, who does the cutlass podcast. Like, yeah. And he's been on mine a bunch of times. Like he, it's just, and I just had an hour long conversation with him about leadership stuff. And then we're going to do a podcast. And he, he sent me an article he wants to talk about. And so it's, it's, it's incredible. Like I just, the uh, like some, ca like casually some retired fleets texting me to me, that's still weird. Like, I'm just yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to get a, a retired Mick on soon. Like just all this stuff that, and it's not just because he's a retired Mick It's because he has a really interesting story to tell. Um, but yeah, I just, it's, 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 I've kind of let it evolve into freely into this wild thing. It's like the people give me a weird joke in earlier about the three hour, four hour podcast that I do sometimes. And it's like, I've found that uh, I, I arrive in these unexpectedly amazing places with, with guests when I just kind of say, it's going to go where it goes for as long as it goes. Uh, I can edit it so I can shorten it if I need to, but, or if we like talk about something and somebody gets too vulnerable or just overshares, I can edit, but I have found myself in places with with uh, guests where they're 
we're talking about things and they're sharing things that I would have never imagined was going to come up on the podcast, but it's like incredible content that resonates with the listener and teaches me things. So it's, Absolutely. and that's kind of the theme of like the development of the podcast too. It's just kind of like, it's turning into a whole different thing now that I'm retired, even where I have, I now have two people on the hook to potentially do uh, podcasts that I'm going to publish, but it's, I'm basically going to, I, I really, really would love to turn my podcast platform into like a proceedings magazine podcast form, yeah. like where people are just contributing sporadically, regularly, whatever. Um, and so I'm publishing multiple podcasts per week under the umbrella, but it's like, I want different perspectives than just my own. Even when I'm talking to a guy like you, like, I don't want it to like, I'm, I'm going to flavor this conversation with my perspective and opinion and whatever. And I want to hear from other people and other perspectives, even, even if they're like wildly opposed to what I'm talking about or, or just a contrary opinion, like bring it, come, come, come on with it. I want to hear mm -hmm. from everybody. I want to talk to everybody. Um, but I also want, like, I, I got a couple of junior sailors. I think it's going to, it might be a one-off. I don't know. Um, they're going to do a podcast on, I think it's the, so like the misadventures of, uh, this previous McPon uh, when he went to the aircraft carrier and gave yeah, yeah, like yeah. notorious all hands call, but it's two E sixes. They're going to talk about it. And I'm not even going to be on it. Like I'll probably, I'll bookend it with an intro outro, but I don't want to flavor that conversation at all. I want, I want to hear their perspective on it. How did they ex experience that? How did they yeah. interpret everything he said? I mean, Which, my son's, you know, my son's an E5 and his best right. friend's an E5 is in, and they, they, you know, I'm just listening to them. They were, they were both mm -hmm. home for Christmas and just hearing them talk about, yeah. it, you know, yeah. they're the E5 perspective on that, you know, is interesting, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I think I know generally uh, how it was interpreted. I mean, if nothing else from just filtering through like Reddit and the memes that just like flooded the Navy internet, like on social media and everything. But I, I don't really know. And it's like, and from person to person, I'm sure there's like nuanced differences. And it's like, I want, I want to hear about that. And I think my listeners do too. Yeah. Um, so that's the goal um, is I, I got a, a handful of people that I'm talking to about doing it. Uh, and so that's, you know, I, I would have never imagined that's where it was going to go. Yeah, I never you, imagined I'd end up on YouTube and all you this buy a, stuff. You buy a microphone. Next thing you know, you've done all that, these yep, things. You uh, never. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm I heard you, I heard you talking on a podcast where like the PXO school would wanted uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, we're recommending to listen to your podcast and PXO yeah. school are, these are, these are, uh, officers who are about to become the executive officer, either on yeah. a ship or a submarine. And they're, they've been recommended shook. to listen to your podcast. So how does that feel? I, I was shook. I like, it was my first really, um, like really great, like meaningful, uh, concrete indicator that the idea I had of retiring and doing this, which it's not, it's not the only reason I retired. There's a lot of other reasons, but, um, I was really excited at the idea of being able to devote more time and bandwidth and effort to the podcast. And it freed me up to do YouTube and expand in all these ways that I wasn't before, but, it was the first really meaningful sign I had that institutional change was possible in this way, because if they're recommending me at the XO school, like at the PXO pipeline, you're, I'm access, not only am I accessing, but, but they care enough and believe enough in what I'm doing to think it's important enough yeah. to recommend it to what is effectively um, two of the three triad members, right? Because they're, those XOs become COs. So it's like, I'm not just accessing uh, exos like I'm accessing exos that are going to become COs. And that's like, I, I still like have a hard time wrapping my mind around it. And gr granted, like they're not all going to access it. It's not like it's part of the curriculum. It's just on a list of recommendations, but it was a, it was a sign to me that not, I, I, I kind of knew they were listening already. Um, just analytics and, like people have recommended it and Hey, I texted this to all the active fleet master chiefs. I'm like, thanks. I don't know how I feel about that. This is what I'm still on active duty. Um, but it's like, I, I kind of knew they were listening based on the analytics of who's listening. Um, but I had never seen like an overt sign of like, not no. only are they listening, but they, it's like, it's resonating. And, and when I had a listener, cause I didn't even see it myself, a listener reached out to me and said, Hey, they're recommending your podcast at PXO school. I'm like what? <laughs> like, yeah. cause yeah. I didn't, it's not like I, I try, I pushed it. I didn't sell myself to anybody. It just happened. And that was really, really encouraging to me. And there's a few other instances like that where the institution 
um, like, or a, a, a subset of the leadership in, in the institution that is the Navy was actively recommending, like, you need to go listen to this dude. And I was just like, mm -hmm. I, okay, yeah. like, maybe <laughs> I can make this work the way that I thought. So. That's wild. Yeah. Uh, let, let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, you have a passion for leadership. You have a passion for seeing yes. better leadership in the Navy. What are some of the challenges you see in Navy leadership today? And not, you know, you don't have to, you know, throw them under the bus, but, but some things that, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of problems. Uh, I read a yeah. lot of news stories, suicides are up, uh, mm -hmm. people are frustrated. Uh, you know, people, there was, there was a lot of conflict over the COVID shots and a lot mm -hmm. of people got a good people yep. left over that. What are some of the, some of the leadership challenges that you see in happening in the Navy these days? Because I'm limited in time, the one I'm going to focus <laughs> on was, I talked, I talked to a first class or, uh, a few days ago. Um, she's trying to start a podcast. That's one of the people I'm talking to about. Like that podcast would be one of the ones that would be under my publishing umbrella if that's how she decides to go with it. But uh, she asked me, I, we, well, we ended up on the topic and she asked me a question that it's to me, and it sounds harsh when I say it, and I say it regularly nowadays. Um, and it's highly influenced by a book called The Peter Principle. Uh, it's about hierarchies and how they work. I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, but it's leadership and competence is, is, is the problem. And it's, it's a broad umbrella to put a bunch of stuff under. But what I find is the Navy likes to deal with the symptom of, of problems with nav admins and programs and, and remedial training and stuff like that. And it's almost always reactive, but, uh, you, in addition to being reactive, it's always treating what is only the symptom of a problem. And an example is acute mental health issues in the military. It's they're looking at it, you know, in a vacuum, like we have these mental health issues. We need mm. to do mental health things to fix mental health issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But why, why is it, it, why is the rate of suicide skyrocketing? Why is the acute mental health issue skyrocketing? Why in the, in the words of Mick Pond Smith during that notorious all hands call, can we not get enough mental health resources to keep pace with demand, no matter what we do? Why is that the case? Because it wasn't the case before. We, I mean, we've always had mental health issues in the military, but we have like really bad acute mental health issues all over the place that are affecting uh, unit efficacy and the ability to deploy. And I mean, look at the SRBs they're offering the sailors to come into the Navy. Like you just got to be breathing and we'll give you six figures. Like, please join the military. So, um, but they, they it, I, I feel, uh, I, and I can't concretely say this because I've never been in DC in those rooms, but based on the behavior of the organization, they don't recognize that the, to me again, like, and, and I think like any, any sailor or, or military member, or probably a veteran that you ask the reason why you have the level of stress that leads to acute mental health issues is poor leadership and mm. the leadership interactions that, that affect the lives of these sailors so, so badly that we end up with acute mental health issues. Mm -hmm. It's just incompetence because consider like, you're, like we're both submariners, right? You're not gonna stand a watch unless you're trained and qualified to do so. So right. how dare us as an organization allow people into leadership positions without being trained and qualified to do what we're asking of them. And yeah. it's wildly more impactful uh, and, and just like meaningful to the organization and the mission we're trying to accomplish that they're ready to do that. Right. Like yeah, I stood diving yeah. off to the watch for three years. It's infinitely more important that I'm as qualified and prepared and knowledgeable as I was about ships control that with leadership. Like I, I have like six, seven people in my division. I have about 12 to 15 in my department, depending on the size of the submarine. It's like those people are the end user of my leadership. If I'm incompetent at doing that, yeah, not just not just the because you, you talk about it and people think about like our interactions like on a day-to-day -day basis, just talking or how I treat you or how I make you feel. Those are all really important, but also I can wreck your entire outlook and level of, of motivation, commitment to the mission and the organization and everything else without ever seeing you in real life. I can do it with a pen. I can do it inside of incepts when I, de I de deny your leave or recommend that it not be approved or just sit on it for forever, right? Like there's all kinds of things I could do where I just destroy your uh, like sense of belonging to this organization without ever even seeing you. And, and that probably happens quite a bit on larger platforms like an aircraft carrier or a base or whatever. So to me, it's 
rampant leadership incompetence. And mm -hmm. it's not the fault. And this is an important point because it, it does sound so harsh. It sounds like I'm attacking everybody wearing khakis in the military. And I'm not because I used to be that guy. It's not their fault. They don't know how to do it. It's the organization's responsibility to teach them how to do it. And I often uh, align this or parallel it with uh, culinary specialists. Everybody complains about food constantly, right? I got a fancy culinary degree, real industry experience. If you let me go teach, you're, that's going to be the best food you've ever had on a ship because I have that capacity, that level of knowledge, the training and the experience to, to do that. However, if you keep me tied up in, in ships control, which is what happened on my last submarine, the food's not going to be that good. I, mm -hmm. I don't have any fleet returnees. I have a, a division of junior guys that never see me because all, and I was like, I was standing eight hours of dive every day, plus post watch, pre watch, brief, and all this shenanigans. That I don't know if that, that happened in your time, but oh, it yeah. <laughs> just keeps growing. Like, yeah. where they're just making up ways to steal more of your time. And then, yeah, you know, I'd get off watch and I'm, I was a battle stations drill guy. So I was writing drills and anomalies and route yeah. the drill package, brief the captain, do all, <laughs> do all that. I was an assistant ship's diving officer. I was writing and grading exams. I was sitting at sitting dive boards. I was yeah. doing all those. And then the cob would pawn a lot of his work off on me because he was preparing me to be a cob. So I'm signing the plan of the day. I'm doing checkouts as the cob for duty chief and all this other stuff. I was the simio. I was president of every NJP. I was doing the command climate survey. It, it was never ending. What I wasn't doing was my job. Thank God I had a, a just hyper capable second class uh, as an LPO, but it also like I had moments where I had to put that kid back together again with a glue stick because he was falling apart under the stress of all the things that he was doing that were my job, but yeah. I couldn't, you know, I didn't have the bandwidth to do it. And it was like, I, I argued and, and tr I tried to get off the watch wheel so I could spend time training the guys. I tried to get off the watch wheel just so I could be a, a, a resource that was available to my LPO and help him out. Cause it wasn't fair that he had to do all those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and we've, yeah, we've, and it was it's almost like we've we've loaded too much onto because I always say that if you're not a, if you're a doer, you're not a leader, you know, uh, and I see that in the civilian world a lot where people sure. will yeah. get themselves so busy that they never see their team. Right. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it wasn't that you wanted to be that busy. You were you were forced to be that busy. Right. Like, it's like to do right. your job is all these other things. And you're like, well, wait a second. Mm -hmm. I also have to run this department. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and you've, it, you've given me zero time to run the department. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and I would say, yeah, practically, like uh, if you're doing it, like if I'm getting my hands dirty, then I'm not actively leading. But it, yeah, it was it was very much a bandwidth issue because I was leading. I just wasn't doing it in the in the my work center or my department. Yeah. Like yeah. I would come by as much as I possibly could. But like I was leading the ship. I was I was leading us in battle stations, missile things, which are very important. It's, it was it was our primary missile uh, primary uh, mission on a ballistic missile submarine. So it's yeah. like, yeah, we have to do those things. War day is important, I guess. Like you got to train and be proficient so that if we're called upon to do it, we can do it. And we know we can do it. Um, so, but in the mind of, an, of a nuclear train, like so an 1120 commanding officer, that's all that matters. Like food, yeah, whatever, lunch will be there. Like they don't, they don't care about those things. They don't care that I have instructions that tell me that like, you're going to have a jag man on your hands if I don't do my job well, because I'm managing, you know, half a million dollars of, of food. The LSs are managing just millions upon millions of dollars of, of inventory of parts and, and oh, it's, and everything it's, else. it's incredible. Yeah. It, and the right. thing is like, if you want to, <laughs> You know, people people don't realize like when you're when you're locked in a metal tube and you're out there for months at a time, food is really important. It's like, real it's, important. <laughs> it's about the only thing good you have in life. Yeah, is, is your food, right? And if your food sucks, you're not gonna have a happy crew. Right. I can tell you that. You know, right? And, exactly. and we always had we we just had amazing uh, we had amazing crew on on the Tennessee, and we always mm -hmm. had the the best food, and and yeah. I'll never forget yeah. that. And uh, but I, but you're right. And I think one of the things you touched on, I think is really important. You said, and I think this is really, really key. We do a really good job, especially in the submarine ports and getting, mm -hmm. getting qualified on watch stations, yep. right? You have to spend and a lot of time, you got to prove your knowledge and, yep. and, and, you know, getting your dolphins is not an easy task, right? It's right. a long, long process. And mm -hmm. people think, well, you're an officer. That was easy. No, it was not easy. No, it's they, not. No, they it's take not. you, they take you through just <laughs> the life of a junior officer. Sweet <laughs> Jesus. Like yeah. top three things I wouldn't want to do on a submarine, be yeah. an egg anger, being a, a nuclear electrician and be a junior officer on their first yes. tour. Good oh, yeah. Lord. I don't have any Especially a butter either, bar but like, showing up yeah. as an ensign. That yep. sucked. Oh, <laughs> I can tell you that for sure. Yikes. But uh, 
but yes, but one of the things is they do a really good job qualifying you to do these really difficult things, right? Yeah. Um, but yet we don't have a qualification process for leadership. Mm -hmm. You don't have a qual card for we don't. being qualified to be a leader. Right. We don't even have a, a robust leadership development and education program, which I, I, I understand like not having a PQS for it or mm. a, a qualification process, even though I think you could accomplish that in a, in a productive way. We don't even have like, we, we don't put time, effort and resources into just caring enough to do like robust leadership development and education. Like mm. they, you see these little like tiny efforts, which feels like they're trying to address the symptom of a problem where we like you back in, back in the day, they had like nav lead probably when you were in, yeah, went we to did. a couple of those courses and they're pretty good. But then the, the, as soon as, uh, Netsy, the education and training command had a budget cut, the first thing they cut was nav lead, which is mm. insane. I would, I would delete every other school there is except yeah. leadership. Like that would be the last thing to go. So then, uh, it, they went into the command delivered training, which was the most brain dead decision. I, I've ever analyzed in my entire career in and out of the Navy as far as like, like, oh yeah, you know what? The command that can barely do what they need to do and sleep at the same time, you got to do the leadership development stuff too. Uh, so the PO indoc turned into a box check. Like they weren't, most commands didn't even do it. They just went into whatever the yeah, system was yeah. and checked it off. Um, so then they were like, okay, well, there's recognition finally that this is a giant waste of time, money and whatever. It's not even happening really. So they came up with, uh, it's NLEC ELD, it's the Naval Leadership and Ethics Center is uh, doing an enlisted leadership development thing where they kind of compromised with the brick and mortar versus uh, like command deliver and stuff where they want a bunch of people that are on shore duty to get uh, certified as facilitators. And then we kind of uh, pull from wherever those people are, when those people have bandwidth, organize a class, and then all the people come in and, and get that class. I've heard good and bad reviews, mostly good. The problem being they started, they came up with it. They're like, oh, hey, this is a great idea. We're going to stand up all this infrastructure. And then once it's solid state, we're going to mandate it as like a PMK thing you need to do before you promote. Uh, the problem is COVID happened. So like they right when they were starting to try to roll it out, COVID just ate all that progress. Mm -hmm. And then it never really spun back up. There was never really any yeah. sense of urgency once COVID kind of calmed down to spin that program back up so it's like it's still not really it's just this thing i talk about occasionally and it seems like a thing that they're just talking about occasionally on on the active duty side of it um that it, it's not it doesn't seem to be gaining momentum um and then i've actually heard which is discouraging um the ones that are happening are kind of not great um mm -hmm. lately which I, I haven't heard that from a lot of people so i'm hoping that it's an anomaly but yeah it's there's just they're not even doing education like along the whole way. And that, like when I started the podcast, that was the recognition of, of I joined the Navy, got zero leadership development and education outside of happening upon strong mentors, which was blind luck until I got to the senior enlisted academy as a chief. And that was early. I was like a 15 year chief eligible for senior chief. And I sque squeaked in one of those classes that had an opening. So 15 and years in and you're starting 15 to get your first years in, which yeah. I mean, all my, if I had bad behaviors, every single one of them was ingrained in me. Every one of them had been validated along yeah. the way through promotions and awards and advancement through positions. And every, like, so by the time you get to the senior enlist Academy, I mean, 50% of the people that I was there with were there to check a box mm -hmm. that they perceive it. Cause it was going to become mandatory to make master mm -hmm. chief. So they were there to, and I heard them say it out loud. Senior chiefs just like, I don't care. I'm just here to like get the pre piece of paper so I can promote. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it was, it, it was mind blowing to me. It should be a CPO Academy because that was the level of what was happening there. And it blew my mind. Like it was incredible. And I'm not saying like, I didn't, it didn't revolutionize my like leadership outlook, but I learned some stuff and I thought it was extremely productive. And it's, it felt like the type of thing we should be putting chiefs through within like the first year or two of mm -hmm. their uh, wearing khaki. So, but we're not even doing that. Like we're not, we can, we can't even get the throughput up on the senior enlisted Academy to make it mandatory to promote to master chief. Like mm -hmm. there's not that many master chiefs in the Navy when you like right. compare it to the, to the scope of the energy, like quarter million ish people in the Navy. I mean, how many master chiefs are there? Like a couple thousand, 
maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you can't even get those. And, and you're looking at eligibles. So there's more senior chiefs. So like multiply that by whatever, but I, we can't even get a throughput of like five to 10,000 people on one school. Mm. And so it's, but I bet you that throughput exists on like fucking sorry. Um, some like technical school for a gangers or yeah, some yeah. wire rate technical school. That's like, there's radio men and sonar in schools that are six months long. Like yeah. how, how can we do that? But we yeah. can't have, I mean, I was in residence for three months and did like six weeks or three weeks and did six weeks on blackboard online. Well, even if you're at one of these schools that you, you could embed leadership as part of the program, right? Exactly. You know, sure. Especially yep. as you are ranking up. And one of the things mm -hmm. I like about the Navy is you start off, you know, with you're a doer, right? And then as you, you evolve into a leadership role, and when you reach yeah. that chief petty officer, usually a first class petty officer, you've got some right. some good leadership responsibilities. And then then you, you you become a chief and then really your, your, your doing goes down and your leading is supposed to take over. Yeah. So you would think that as you progress in your Navy journey, as you're sent to schools, that they should be weaving the leadership into your whatever class, your, whatever yeah. schools you're going to, uh, yep. because, OK, now you're in the E5 range or sorry, e, uh, uh, E6, E7 range. Here's mm. here's the training that should go along with that because now you're right. leading a group of ten people, likely. Yeah. So so yep. you know, but you, you could weave that into existing schools. My son, who's an E5, he spent two years in school before yeah. he showed up to his ship. Right. I two years. It. Two solid two years. years. Yeah. <laughs> Nukes are. It's like four years. Yeah. And it's yeah. like like re okay, so like you're telling me that leadership isn't important in the operation of a nuclear reactor. I beg to differ. Like, yeah. <laughs> like well, how are we as officers? And I don't know if it's the same, you know, since I've left, but mm -hmm. we had a technical rating. That was very important in your technical rating determined what likely if you got command, essentially, mm -hmm. you didn't have a leadership rating. You had a technical rating. It was based on how you did at nuke school, how you did prototype, how you did on the engineer's exam and how yeah. you did uh, serving, you know, in your first JO tour, you have a technical yeah. rating. And I always thought, like, why why not a leadership rating? I mean, right. that should be that's even more important than how to be you know, the commanding officer of a submarine. You would think We're that not leadership value is number leadership. one, not like yeah. you know, yeah. you know, how many how many Holy control rods in the reactor, Jesus. right? Yeah, you know? like not that that's not really important. Also, like I don't I a lot of times when I talk to people, like I don't want to discount the importance of technical competency at all. Like it's really right, important. Right. The submarine is trying to kill you at all times with pressurized hydraulics, pressurized air, radioactive material, the seawater outside the people tank fire. If it decides to rear its ugly head, like it's you, it's really important that you know how to fight that ship, but yeah. we're doing a really good job of making sure people are ready to fight that ship by right. all of those metrics we talked about earlier with the qualification submarines and then the qualification yeah. and proficiency and training that we get uh, for watch stations. And so weave some else, people so. skill stuff in there. Weave some yeah. leadership stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and I'm not, like I say this all the time, which makes me feel like people think I am, but like, I'm not auditioning for the job, but there are plenty of people like me that yeah. like, I talked to Dave Deary uh, of the enlisted leadership foundation. That was, a I just had that podcast come out today. Um, I was like, when I talked to him, he's already kind of doing it. They have like leadership academies. They're a nonprofit with a bunch of like retired fleets and CMCs and all that. Uh, there's probably some officers in there too. I'm just not aware. Uh, like I know Joanne Ortloff's involved. She's a retired fleet mass chief, um, blah, blah, blah. But it, it's, they run leadership academies in the San Diego area and commands can use uh, travel funds to send somebody at, at cost orders TAD to these leadership academies when the schedule permits. And they'll do it for you. So mm. I'm like, why, 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 Department of the Navy, have we not cut this man a check yet? Just mm. let him do it. Like, yeah. like it's not, you don't even need, I've been saying that for years about, not, it went from just chief season involvement to leadership development and education across the board to uh, like leadership period. Why we're not leveraging veterans and retirees for those jobs. Mm. I, I'm beside myself. Like, one of my cobs, uh, he was my cob when I made chief uh, on the Jimmy Carter. And uh, he's the guy that pinned my mass chief fingers on me, like with my wife. Uh, he, I, he's a national treasure. Uh, that guy, I mean, he would volunteer to do it. He doesn't need the money. Like, you know what I mean? Like there are people yeah. that, especially being in the, in the capacity I am now, I would volunteer to do it. 
I, you don't got to pay. I mean, granted, like if it became a full-time job, it's a different conversation. But like, if I'm just showing up to facilitate a class twice a month, just to have that access to sailors, like I might bring a microphone and use some of it for my own purposes, but like I would do it just because I love doing it and it's extremely yeah. rewarding and fulfilling, but it also feels like, like, it's like my prime directive. I feel like I have a responsibility to do it still, mm. even yeah. though I'm not in uniform anymore. So, so sign me up. Like I'd yeah. sign up on a volunteer sheet to come facilitate that course that like if ELF expanded to like, now they're in Norfolk and, Washington and, you know, I don't know, like wherever, um, Groton where we're doing it that way. Like sign me up. You don't got to pay me a dime. And I bet you, you would see, I mean, it might not be, you might not get enough volunteers to sustain that, uh, at the one that you scale it up, but the resources are abundant and they're just not being oh, yeah. leveraged yeah. outside of, cause that's what they probably, some bean counter in whatever, wherever Bupers is in DC probably is, is looking at their spreadsheet and going, well, we couldn't do that because we, we don't have enough active duty sailors to man ships and shore commands. So how, what active duty sailors are we going to send to go do this? Yeah. How about not, a couple of us, us not, veterans out here? That's how many, <laughs> like you got, yeah, you, me, Jeff Bayless, Jason Thompson, yeah. uh, Paul Kingsbury. Like I could go on yeah, and that yeah. would all be my retired Cobb. And I mean, Rick West lives in my area like yeah. retired Mick Ponds just that would happily they show up to the senior enlisted academy all the time and go into leadership hall and like just soak up like like people think that they're there because the senior enlisted academy asked them they're there for because they want to access sailors they want to mm -hmm. access chiefs and hang out with chiefs and feel like they're back in the game for a minute yeah and it's yeah. like that's that's why you would get such a robust response in my opinion uh, yeah to that kind of a thing so yeah it blows my <laughs> mind that they haven't just cut Dave Deary a check you mentioned something, you, your, your prime directive. I think it's really important. Um, what is your prime directive? Why, why do you do what you do? So um, again, I mean, at the, at the Genesis, it was, um, I saw a gap. I, I, I saw sailors struggling uh, and there was no mechanism. The, the organization was not providing what they needed. Um, and having come off Jimmy Carter, where I had that cob, I think that had a that had a big role in it. Um, but also just the way I was raised, it's like, if I see a problem, like it's, it's like to an extent I, I I've had to rein it in because it's actually, it's legitimately done harm to me in a lot of ways, but the principle really is, uh, is like, if I have the ability to help, I have the responsibility to help. Mm. And I, I, I've applied that principle pretty, pretty, uh, I don't know if harshly is the right word, maybe, but like sternly to myself as a chief, right? And I don't, and and just as a military member, it's like I don't think that the responsibility ends when my service ends. Like to veterans, active duty sailors, like I I just feel like if I can help when it when it's and and I've I've limited myself to like where I'm not like giving so much of myself that it's harming me, which is what I got to that point when I was on active duty a few times, but. I just didn't at the time, I didn't think that was possible. I just thought I had this like capacity to help people and it would never like, I, it would never be too much, but yeah, I just feel like it's a, it's just a responsibility. I, I can't not, I, I don't know. I think it has a lot to do with how my parents raised me. I mean, we were, we were volunteering constantly. I basically grew up in a, in a, um, what do they call it? It was a nonprofit that like helped people with groceries. It's not like a soup kitchen. It was like a, like a, food bank um yeah we yeah, i bank. basically yeah. grew up in that place mm. with all these senior citizens that were like churchgoers that volunteered their time and then it was my mom and uh the director was a you know like about close to my mom's age a little bit older i think but they and they were the passionate like mission driven like we're trying to really make an impact and it was just like i that's how i was running around in there as a kid i was we grew up i grew up in the church as well uh, like the non-denominational Christian side, like it was, it was more contemporary. Uh, yeah. I don't know, like yeah. Christianity. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just how we were raised to help each. I have three brothers as well. So it's like, you kind of grow up in that, like we're a team. And so we help each other out. And if they need me, I'm there. Like, so it's, I don't know. Like, I think a big part of it was how I was raised, but then being in the military. And, and so my experience from like day one to, 
day chief was like pretty negative, like really bad leaders learning the, the wrong way to do it. Um, and luckily I, I largely interpreted that as like, when I'm in the position, I'm not going to treat my people this way. Uh, turns out that wasn't entirely true because I had never been developed as a leader and educated. So I kind of freaked out when I was an LPO and turned into a bit of a yeller and like a screamer and do what I want now without explaining. Uh, and then within probably six months in my, into my LPO tour, I, I figured out that I was, I was doing what I hated. Uh, mm. from my initial like i yeah. i regressed to my lowest level of training which is a line from some admiral somewhere during world war ii um it, it's i didn't know what to do so i was i was mimicking what i had seen and experienced that's it, that's it. without really realizing it until there was this one day that I, i've talked about on the podcast a million times it's like i was in the in the galley just spraying like just <laughs> lighting all my which i did frequently enough about 30 seconds into what I was freaking out about, you just saw everybody glaze over. Like no one was listening. Mm -hmm. I bet you if I had stopped and said, what were the last three words? I just said, like, no one could tell me. Mm -hmm. And I just stopped. And I'm like, like, you aren't even listening to me. Like mm -hmm. you're, I, and I just walked out of the galley and I like went and reevaluated my whole existence as a leader. Cause I was just like, <laughs> I'm failing and I'm doing what I hated coming up. And I swore I would never do that. So I'm like, okay, how do I fix this? And then I made chief and that I was barely ready. I mean, I was a nine and a half year chief. And uh, luckily I was on that unit, which was like a CPO Academy. I mean, yeah. Jimmy Carter, you got to volunteer to be there. So you got to think about who is going to volunteer to be on a special projects platform. That's gone 300 days a year, type a personalities that are experienced that like everybody wants to be there. So we had, the best chiefs mess in the Navy, in my opinion. And mm. I had a cob that was on his third cob tour. He was a CMC at this point. Like just, it was, it was this depth and breadth of experience and knowledge that I, I couldn't have found anywhere else. And I spent three years just getting like, I couldn't do anything wrong because if I did, I'd get my, I'd get snatched up, dragged into the chief's quarters. What are you doing with your life? Here's why mm. that was stupid that I couldn't get away with anything. Anytime I screwed stuff up, I was, I was getting corrected immediately. I got mentored a ton by really great chiefs. I, like it was the perfect storm in my opinion. And I think that's why I'm as like, and, and some of it has been intellectual curiosity along the way. Cause I'm a, I'm a fixer. I like fixing problems. Hmm. I want to find the actual answer, but a huge part of it about the, the, reason that I am the way that I am outside of just the context I grew up in was that mess was like, uh, it was like going to college to be a chief. It was, mm -hmm. I wish I could replicate it somehow and make every chief experience it because it was, it was just this perfect storm of, of incredible chiefs, senior chiefs, master chiefs, that Cobb was God, he was incredible. Uh, I mean, he still is. I, I love him to this day. I still talk to him, but, and the CO, the X, I mean, everybody, it was just, yeah, and those, and those are magic yeah. moments when you have yeah. when you have a Cobb, an XO, a CO mm -hmm. that are, you know, you've got that triad that are, yeah. are good. You know, those are those are lucky. few and far between moments. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, you just soak it up and enjoy it. I, I you know, I know I had, you know, my first commanding officer was was tough. He was a he he was mm -hmm. he was old school, you know, yep. a yeller, a puncher, a, yep. a poker. He was physical, um, but he you know, we had a good mass chief, good XO. And, and mm. it was a, it was a great, it was a great place to be, to learn as a young, yeah. you know, as a young officer, right. uh, the standards were very high. Like you said, if you screwed up, you get, you know, called yep. in, let's, let's talk. What'd you do? Yep. You know? And I think those experiences are really good when you have those great leaders that are, you know, mentoring you, showing you, teaching you, you know, fixing you when you screw up. I think that was for sure. For me, yeah. at least that was super helpful in my leadership development. Absolutely. As well. And I think wow. like part of the reason it, it's, it's a, like a, a, a secondary part, but like, I think my being that lucky and getting to experience, getting to experience that and feeling that way about like, man, I wish everybody could experience that. Mm. Like, I think that's like a secondary reason about why I feel this responsibility. Like it's just, and it's, eh, there's something about being a steward of these, of the, I call them kids. People give me grief for it. It's, I don't <laughs> have kids. any kids. I don't have any kids. My kids. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any kids. 
but so, the kids that I'm leading in the Navy yeah. are my, are my kids. Like yeah, I, I yeah. feel that way yeah. about like, like I love them to the point that I will, I want to do whatever I can to help them. And I feel this responsibility to do so because I was trusted with their care essentially. Like yeah, I, yeah. I just, it's this inescapable feeling of, of duty to these people that I don't think I'll ever get away from. Like I'm in college to be a psychologist so that I can do research and be a clinician that like volunteers to with a, I don't know, the VA, if it's a job or like volunteers with a nonprofit to counsel veterans. Like I, I'm, it's never, I'm never going to be detached from it. I, I I'm mm -hmm. still doing the podcast for that reason. Um, and I, and I, it's, I just, I can, I have the capacity to help. So I, I feel like it's, it's interesting. There's responsibility. A there's this Lisa Haysha quote that I love. And it said, great mm. leaders don't start off to be a leader. They start off to make a difference. And yeah. it sounds like that's what your prime directive is, is to try to make right. a difference. Right. And, and arguably I quit being a leader so that I could make a difference. So you could make you know a bigger I mean? like, difference. I yeah. clocked out of the military b before I had ever planned to, I wanted to be a CMC. I wanted to yeah. take it all the way. Um, but I, I was too attracted to that part, like the making a difference part. And that was what it was all about from the beginning anyway. Like I wanted to go all the way with it because I thought as my sphere of influence grew, I could make a bigger and bigger difference, which is true and not. Like if I'm, if I'm staying within the hierarchy of, of the Navy, I don't think it's true for me. I don't think I would be able to do it because like I talked about on that, I think you listened to the sphere of influence one where I don't think I could have done it if all my bandwidth had to be devoted to being the command master chief of right. command x right right, Be right i can create resources i have probably over a thousand hours of podcasts you could go to yeah. and it doesn't draw on my bandwidth or attention span or effort right. or whatever anymore you can just go listen to them and you're making the an impact yeah you're making probably a bigger impact by doing yes. this than than if you could you right. know, do it inside you're so you're doing sort of outside Mm. you know, the, the constraints of the military, uh, yeah. now, and, well, you were doing it inside before, but yeah. you're probably making a bigger difference doing it this way than, than for being, sure. being in that command. So it's really for sure. interesting, like, really interesting. I mean, I bet, and I bet seven years ago, you didn't think that was going to be the case. I didn't at all. Yeah. I, I yeah. thought I was going to do it for a few years, get a library of, of things that, that could just be static that I could refer people to. And then I was just going to drop it. Yeah, I, like maintain it on the internet, but like I was gonna just walk away from it. That was the, the initial plan. I was never, yeah. I was never gonna do this for seven years plus. Um, and here we are. I love well, I what I love about listening when I listen in, I feel like for some reason I feel like I'm back on the boat. You know, you know the conversations <laughs> you have on watch where they're you know yeah, you're on these yeah. long watches and you just have you talk about everything. And I, I think yeah. you have a very great conversational style in the podcast. And, and, uh, like, yeah. and I just think, like I said, you, you could just listen to you talk about issues. You know, sometimes you have guests, sometimes you're, you, mm -hmm. you just you, yourself. And, and yeah. I, I like that about it. So if people listen into the podcast, what are they going to get out of it? What, what, what are the, con what's kind of content do you put out there? Just for I those mean, who haven't listened yet. Yeah. You kind of said it. So I, everything from, uh, at the very beginning, it was focused on, basic like i was aiming at junior sailors so the beginning of it is a lot of uh like formal topics like i started with like uh active list or active communication and mm. uh um, like leadership principle based stuff just explaining yeah. what it is and why it's important because i was targeting like the e4 that got put in a work center suit position early and was like oh god what do i do <laughs> um but then it evolved pretty quickly into uh, just all types of leadership things that I thought were interesting. Um, the recognition of the flaws in the chief's mess. Um, and then it kind of expanded out into a, like a lot of different things. I, I was, I'm a big fan of leading with stories. I heard a talk, I believe it was at the senior list Academy, but it's on YouTube as well. And I forget the gentleman's name, but there's an excerpt of him talking in my leading with stories podcast, which is like one of the first dozen or so. Um, where he talked about the power of leading with stories. And so I, I, that was kind of where the spin the yarn concept came from, which is my shorter uh, off the cuff type things um, where I'm just, it's just me. I'm talking off the top of my head. Generally it's, it's, it used to be uh, sp like a spontaneous thing would happen at work. Like I'd be in a meeting and some things would happen or, or I'd have some interactions with some sailors or, or I'd be told about something that happened in the mess or we'd be at a DRB or whatever. And that would be, I'd come 
talk about that and try to pull all the lessons from it. And a lot of the times it was like the DRB went off the rails and the sailor didn't leave taken care of. So then I did walk out and go put them back together again and try to be a resource or whatever. And, or I'd ex be expressing my frustration about something that happened or whatever. Um, and then I, I, I wanted to loop back to some of the, like, I wanted like an academic, um, approach to like foundational principles. So we have some foundations episodes where I was trying to get other people to do it. Cause that's not really my strength. My strength is the off the top of the head conversational type stuff. Uh, so I had Andy was a, a corpsman chief and now he's a supply officer. He got, he commissioned through OCS, I think. Um, and then like, so we had those and Paul Kingsbury did one for me too. Um, problem being, I got to find somebody who willing to commit the time and effort to doing them. So uh, we have stuff like that on there. Um, I've done, I, and it, it's expanded out into other ideas. I have a lot of heritage episodes. I'm a big history dork. I got the I museum that. Yeah. behind me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a collector of, there's a lot of stuff on these walls. I got a big case of uh, submarine dolphins and combo cover anchors over here. And just all, oh, it's like a museum in here, but I'm a collector and, and studier of history. Uh, so I really like using those stories as examples. Um, but also just, just educating people. Like I, yeah. I had this really powerful moment. Um, I've always been this way, but I, I've had this really powerful moment when I was at the A school where I came in one day, we would form up for uh, like the end of the day uh, on one day where we would, oh, they had this like student of the week award. It was like an all hands call on the boat, but with the student population. And I came down because uh, we're the classrooms on, and offices are on the second deck. We would come down to where they'd be forming up like in the little galley space where we did our training and then marching wherever back to the barracks or to the, uh, call them defects on army bases, but like the galley. Um, and so I came down at the end of one day, we were going to talk to him, whatever. And I, I came down and everybody was there already. And I was like, cause we marched with cadence. Like I hear him coming from the second floor. And I told the CS one that had marched him over. I was like, Hey man, I didn't even hear you guys. Like, you're like what? I didn't, uh, did you guys sneak in? Like, and he was just like, yeah, students are a little, uh, like struggling with motivation today, uh, senior. And I was like, Oh, really? And I said, <laughs> why? And they, it was a lot of what we would get was we would get a lot of students that were not enthusiastic about being cooks in the Navy, which I get it. I joined as a corpsman, had to switch rates. We don't need to go down that road. I didn't do anything wrong. I just, it was, it, it, I picked what I knew and I, I liked as I, I had cooked before I joined the Navy. Um, but I wanted like, I joined the Navy for an adventure initially. So yeah. I'm like, I want to do something totally different. And then I'll go back to that. But uh, so I understood and there were kids, it was, we would get students that like washed out of whatever a school for some technical thing. Uh, and they would just get told that they were going to go to CSA school because we needed people. So you'd get a lot of that where they just didn't want to be there. Mm. And I was like, okay, let, let's, let's talk about this. So like I went, I kicked the doors off the hinges, walked in and just went absolutely nuts. Cause I was, I was upset like because if you had gone into my office at the time it looked it was like a museum but like i i study cook history and i'm really passionate about it because a lot of people don't think it's important don't care or which i found out after i gave this like <laughs> passionate speech about why they were lucky to be there and why they're part yeah. of a, a really cool story my staff didn't, I had, I had first class instructors that were retiring from that command. I had a lot of people who had been around for a long time and, and it, and it's significant because of what our history is that a large portion of that staff was African-American. And if you look back at the history, there's a great book called the Messman Chronicles. It was written by a corpsman chief, uh, but it was chronicling the, the uh, effectively like the journey of African-Americans in Naval service. And so by virtue of like what segregation was and racism back in the day, it was like they were uh, in ser servant type roles, especially when we were going to lose the Philippines as a territory, because that's what it was before. So I get the Filipino mafia jokes to this day. Um, but it's the um, the history was very rooted in the accomplishments of African-Americans. Like everybody knows who Dory Miller is, but that's where it ends. And it's like, yeah, there are like there's dory miller and, and thank god they're they're naming an aircraft carrier after him i, I got really psyched That's about wild that. yeah it's really but cool. there's the the uss pinckney right the leonard Harmon. those are cooks yeah. those are cooks that earn navy crosses and it wasn't for making breakfast and it's yeah. like they should know these things we have six medal of honor winners yeah. six 
And it's like, and it wasn't because they were good cooks. So it's yeah. like, and they didn't know about any of these things. They didn't know who any of these people were. They didn't know the stories of heroism that earned them that hardware. Oh, they didn't know so anything. Cool. That's so and cool. So I just went nuts giving this speech about how they're a part. I told that a lot of those stories. And I was like, and you get to be here. Like, yeah. it's a privilege to be standing here in the same place, uh, effectively, uh, where those guys stood. And the, like that went on to accomplish those things. You might get detailed to the Pinckney, like, and that ship is named after a cook. That's a big deal. And then yeah. to the, uh, and I told him like African-Americans in the audience, like we always talk about Dory Miller being the first African-American ever in the Navy cross for heroism. Uh, Pinckney did it. Harmon did it. The, yeah. uh, almost probably 80% of those medals of honor are African-American sailors. And that's like, we're talking about the thirties, the twenties, the teens, yeah. yeah. African-Americans yeah. earning the medal of honor for heroism. And so it's just like, it I, I it, it's, it's, you're, you're helped. You change their perspective. You know, it's yeah. not, I'm a cook in the Navy. I, right. I, I, and I have to be here. It's, I get to be here. Mm -hmm. I get to be part of this uh, legacy of, of yeah. great, uh, a great men and women who have done this job before me. And I think that's, yeah. that's powerful. And you help people see things, you, you, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I saw it in my civilian life too. When you give people their why, or you help them mm -hmm. understand yep. that they're not just like, I ran manufacturing plants, right. And right. you're not just plating a part or machining a part. You're, you're helping keep the lights on, mm -hmm. you know, when, you know, we made electrical products. Yep. And when you, when you kind of change the, the story yeah. a little bit, it's like, then they go home and they tell their families, I'm helping keep the lights on, you yes. know, I'm, I'm yes. serving my country in a good way. You know, you, I, you the perspective from yeah. I may, I'm peeling potatoes it's, to I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm serving my country. It's such, it's such a simple and, and largely easy thing to accomplish. Like mm. I, you were on a ballistic missile submarine. So like yeah. I was filling in for the cob for like a week or two or something. Uh, and they had this thing where they wanted the, the, they were having a bunch of issues with Swiss stuff, right? Like procedural compliance tags, all that kind of, all that kind of crap. So I went to MCC, which is, you know, where they hang out, um, for a brief and the XO is with me. Who's now probably post CO tour. He was a CO of the Alabama recently, but, um, he came with me, uh, in lieu of the CO for the brief and, uh, I was acting as the cob. And so like they do the thing where they give the brief and, and missile techs are great at giving briefs, like the, yeah. the way they do it, um, arguably, you know, no offense, but arguably better than the nukes on that boat. Uh, Cause <laughs> yes. I went to their briefs too. And, and the missile techs are on it. Um, but they were having a bunch of issues with procedural compliance and all those types of issues. And when you walked in the room, you like me being me, I'm walking in the room like, oh, this is going to be cool. Like, I'm excited to, to be in this role and and to hopefully offer something to the, like this process, if not just enjoy observing it. And when I walked in, it was like all the air got sucked out. Like everybody looked sad. Everybody was demotivated, frustrated, didn't care. Like, just uh, I just want to not be doing this anymore. I think we might have been in EHW, like loading and offloading. I'm not sure. But, um, and that's a really, really tough time for missile techs, but uh, yeah, yeah, walked in, they were whatever, whatever evolution they were briefing, um, was a big, it was a big one. And when we were done, uh, just I, the vibe in the room, I would like, we got done and, and they go through the alley. Like, Anybody else, you got anything, you got anything, Cobb, XO, right? So they get to me and I'm like, Hey, like buck up. Like you, like, do you know who you are? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know the awesome responsibility that comes along with being trusted to maintain these weapons that are keeping our nation safe from God knows what? And I was yeah. like, you guys are world destroyers. You have the capacity yeah. to, to, to just turn the lights off. Like it's over. Oh, and yeah. it's, we're yeah. trusting you with that awesome responsibility of being just this world destroying force. And you're in here like pouting, like it takes some pride in the fact that you're part, you're, you're this person you're yeah. in this role. Like it's so easy to lose sight of the impact of the thing that you're doing when you're in the grind of doing the, like all the little things that add up to the sum of the mission. Right. And it's like, it's like FSAs in the scullery, like COs love to say that, like, oh, everybody's just as important to the mission. And they always say like from like they'll pick somebody like important, like a nuke or a sonar tech or whatever, or who they they deem to be important all the way down to the FSA in the scullery is always how they end it. And it's yeah. like it's 
it, it is arguably like tr- subjectively true. Um, but it's like, you're, you're not an FSA in the scholar. You're a submariner that's in the process of earning their dolphins. You get to join that story. And that story is fun and impressive and you should be proud to even be here. Yeah. Like you get to be here. Like, do you know how many people would love to be here, but can't because there is a medical disqualification or like, I got a buddy that I do jujitsu with. That's a felon because somebody stole his computer or something. And he confronted them. And when he confronted them, they got in a fight and he beat the crap out. Like he won. He didn't, I mean, he didn't like try to kill anybody, but like he just won. And then the kid pressed charges. So when he was, and he, he was 18 and that kid was 17 and they were in high school and they charged him with a felony. And he wants to work at uh, the shipyard doing that mission, right? Like he wants to be involved in that and he wants to be involved in it for all the right reasons. And uh, he has a hard time because he's excluded based on the fact like getting a security clearance as a felon is not going to be a, it's going to be a tall ask. It's possible. Mm. It's going to be a tall ask. So, and he's, he's my buddy, this other guy that's friends with him as well describes him. He's, he's such a nice kid and he would be such an asset to that organization and he says he has the personality of like a golden retriever. Like that's the best way of dis- like a human golden retriever, the nicest kid on the planet. I love him to death. And so it's so hard to watch a person like that, that just wants to be involved in that thing. And it's, yeah, some of it, like he wants to better his own life and, and make more money and have a career and have a pension one day and all those things. But like, you can tell he cares, like he wants to be involved in that thing. Cause it feels like it would give him a sense of purpose. He doesn't currently have in the, all the jobs he's doing. And it's like, he can't, or he believes he can't right now. Like we're working on it, but there are people like that out there that can't, there are people out there that have medical conditions or some other limiting factor, physically, mentally, whatever, that precludes them from being part of this community. There are people that can't get a security clearance because their credits all left up or because they have all some other issue that precludes them from getting the security clearance you need to be part of this thing. Like this is, there's not a lot of people they're going to let within, you know, arm's reach of a, a ballistic missile. So it's like, that's yeah. a huge deal. Like yeah, you should, is. and I, and I, I was given some perspective on this by some of my friends when I would go back home and visit and I, I, I was going to college graduations and all this stuff. And I felt like a failure. Like, I'm like, they're all graduating from college and going on to these careers and I haven't done anything. And I said it to my best friend growing up. I, I had gone to her college graduation and I said that to her and she like her jaw hit the table and she was like, yeah. what are you talking about? Yeah. You've traveled the world. Yeah. Like you've, you're a nuclear submariner. You live in Hawaii for Christ's sake. Like yeah. you're doing this insane thing that most people like would be afraid to do, let alone like, you, like accomplish what you've accomplished up to this point and blah, blah, blah. She's like, you're, like shut up. You're doing, yeah. you're doing just as well, if not better. And I, and I, I didn't have that perspective at the time, but she put it in perspective for me. And I was just like, I think that's great. Oh. Yeah, that's, that is good. It, and it's good to give people perspective because I think, yeah. especially I've been out, out of the Navy a long time. And you think back at mm-hmm. those, you, we were given a lot of responsibility at a really young yeah. age. It's, you know, that, if you, you look never back, get, you'll never it's get. It's like, yeah, I, it get. shocks me to this day that they let me stand diving off to the watch. I'm like, are you sure? We got done <laughs> with my dive board. I thought I failed. <laughs> we were in the OCAB. So like I was in the SEAL's office, finished the dive board. I walked out. I'm like, God, I got to do this again. Oh my God. Like, cause I'd been stressing out about it, freaking out. Like definitely not my strong suit. Um, even though they thought I was good at it for some reason. And I, there was a, a like a little love seat in my Cobb's office. And I like laid down in it. I'm like covering my face and they called me back in and I went into the guillotine. I think of the guillotines coming, you know, like, and, uh, they like, you pass with lookups and I legitimately dead in the eye to my CEO. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like I was convinced I had failed. Uh, yeah. and they told me, they're like, no, we, because I'm, I'm a compulsive preparer. So I was studying constantly. I was closing the OCAB every day, just studying the volume seven and all the associated books. And so they're like, we knew you knew the answer to all those questions. Like we knew we like you, we weren't going to get any level of knowledge stuff past you. So it was all scenario based, like, Oh, if this yeah. happens, okay. or these are the initial conditions. How are you going to get from A to B with those initial conditions? Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I I struggled a little bit with that to uh, to operationalize it all. And that's what they they had said is like we knew we also knew we that you were going to have a harder time operationalizing all that stuff you had memorized. And so that's why we did it that way. And I was like, interesting. interesting. Thank God, because I still yeah. like I still even even when I was staying on the watch, I I 
it blew my mind that they allowed me to do that. They trusted me to fill in for the cob. I would monitor PD trips. I would like a lot of the stuff they would allow. I would, I would marvel at even like standing topside. I was a line handler supervisor. And I was standing topside on the turtle back, like looking around, like, holy Jesus, like going yeah. down, we were going up the, up and down the Puget Sound, like going under the bridge, people are waving at us. And I'm just like thinking about how I would feel if I was that person on the beach standing there watching yeah. this just enormous sea monster go by with these people standing yeah. on the back just like and they're and, and they're, they're just and they're saying i, I wonder what it's like to be on yeah the, and yeah like, and, we're here <laughs> <laughs> and it's like but also like you can watch the submarine dive in the sound right oh, we, wow. we yeah. dive before you even come out so there's videos on the internet and so imagine like being that person like on the beach watching us yeah. voluntarily submerge the ship and i'm like well, what kind of person does that like yeah, what kind of yeah. person is is willing to do that and does it as a career or, or whatever. And I don't know, like it's still, it's I a still great opportunity. I mean, there's yeah. just, there's not many people have ever done it. You know, if you yeah. look at the yeah. history yeah. of, you know, I this still... country, you know, the people that have, have served <laughs> under the ocean is it's, it's, a, it's still a small group of people yeah. that have done it, you know? Yeah. General, so. Yep. And I, I remember I got relieved for what I knew was going to be my last watch ever. And oh, I like, as hard. soon as I got relieved, I was just like, I got away with it. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I didn't get disqualified. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't crash the submarine in anything. Like, I it just, was hard though that that last watch coming down. I was the yeah. officer deck on on the surface and coming down mm -hmm. that, uh, just coming down from the sail. I, I yep. it was emotional for yep. me because it was my lifehood dream to to do that and yeah. know that it was my last time. It was that's hard. That's really yeah hard. Yeah. yeah. I miss I, it. And, uh, yeah, I believe it. And it's and it's I I feel like to a to an extent. And I I I hear this a lot when I listen to like uh, podcasts or audiobooks that involve like combat veterans. But it's like. You, you just feel like when you're doing normal life, right? Like I'm a full-time college student right now. Uh, I do the podcast. I, uh, I don't know, hang out with my family. I go do <laughs> jujitsu, you know, and, and that's about it. It just feels like the volume is turned down on yeah, life. Yeah, that's it. You know, and yeah, it's like. It's, it's exactly it. I'm, I'm happy it's over. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Like I'm really grateful, not just for the experience and, and the fact that, I now get to be on the other side of it. I, I'm in, incredibly blessed with all the benefits. Like I make, <laughs> I don't like saying this, but I kind of like saying it because it's like, it illustrates how, how privileged I am at this point, like how, how just, and how much gratitude I have for uh, the experience, but the benefits of the experience is like, I make more money right now to do college than I did as an active duty master chief. Mm. What? Like, how does that compute anywhere? And like, granted, I had cancer and a bunch of other yeah. mental yeah. health issues. And, and there's a reason why the VA is paying me money. And it's not because they like me. Um, it, but it's, it's the education benefits are insane. Like I hear these yeah. young college students talking about um, like struggling to pay for books or buy. I had a, I'm in a statistics class and you got to buy one of those fancy uh, TI-84 Gucci mm -hmm. calculators. I don't like I bought it all, but I'm getting reimbursed for everything. Like oh, I don't yeah, got to buy yeah. a paper. Clip. The benefits are crazy. You know, I hear all this stuff it's about student loan debt and all this. I, I have a, insane. I have an undergrad degree and a, and a master's degree that were paid for by the Navy. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking I, about. I got a bachelor's debt. degree on active duty. So I got yeah. an unassociated, like an associated degree. That's not associated with my bachelor's degree. I got an associated degree in culinary arts on the wall. I've got a bachelor's degree in organizational leadership from Excelsior, which is like one of those online military colleges. Yeah. All of that was just tuition assistance on active duty. That was, that yeah. was active duty benefits. Yeah. 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 Now yeah. I have chapter 31 benefits through the VA that yeah. I'm using to pay for my, I'm going to get a bachelor's degree in psychology. It'll probably take about a year and then I'll apply for PhD programs. But then I also have my, I haven't even touched my GI Bill benefits yet. Yeah. And yeah. like, and if, you know, if you're joined, like your son, right. If he marries and has kids while he's in the service, he can transfer those benefits to them. If he wants yeah. get his degree through tuition assistance and CLEP and NC pace and all those other mechanisms out so there. Many opportunities. And then yeah, so many not only does he, he have a degree and a career leaving the military and a pension, if he sticks around long enough and VA benefits, if, if applicable, but then like, he gets to give a college education to his kids. And it's not yeah. just a normal college education. It's a college education with a monthly housing allowance of thousands yes. of dollars, a book stipend. Yes. Like there's all, it's, it's absolutely insane to me. I was, 
I was, uh, there's a podcast coming out next week that I did with Amber Viola, who is a, she's finishing her master's in social work. She's a politically active, incredible. She was a, a GM two um, that worked for me at, uh, when I was an, an instructor, she's one of my NMTIs. Um, she is, uh, she's doing those things, but we were talking about, um, like race topics and political topics and stuff on, on, uh, the podcast I did with her at the beginning. And I went and read a paper, uh, done by some like psychologist or something the other day about, uh, race in the military. And one of the, one of the, and it was in the, the paper, the study that it, the paper was on was about, uh, rates of incarceration. And they were relating like the racial demographics and the likelihood to be incarcerated if they were veterans. And then if not, and one of the things that I, I, I didn't finish reading the whole thing because I was, I had to go to class, but um, one of the things I thought was super interesting was they had, they had basically like speculated as they went into the study that one of the reasons why incarceration rates were so much lower for African-Americans and people of color in the military was because if you think about like when they join the military, if you come from a, a like a underprivileged background, think about the giant leap forward that happens, not just from the income and uh, the stability of like they, cause the military just keep, provides you with everything. You don't even have to think about it. Yeah. Like having to navigate health insurance as a civilian is the bane of my existence Yeah, because I've never done it in my entire adult life until I retired because they just do it for you and you yeah. eat, they give you food, they give you housing, they give you everything. They give you the clothes you can it's wear. A, on your it's back. such a great way to start. It's such a great way. Right. To, and I, I think more and more people should do, mm -hmm. do it because I think honestly, and, and, and it, I'll say it from a from a male perspective. I think young men need an adventure, to be honest, and maybe mm -hmm. young women too. I don't really know yeah. that. You know, we were all male crew back at the time, and right. And uh, but I think I think I think men need an adventure. I think the people mm -hmm. that go from high school to college and never get some sort of adventure in their mm -hmm. life, I think that they they miss out on something. You know, I think that's one that's to, one thing to call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you know, it, I it, mean, it's it that it's and it's a bunch of other things, too. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just, you know, the idea of like locking yourself in a metal tube with, you know, right, right. Oh, you, and, yeah, you <laughs> earn the benefits. But like, yeah, it's like a huge it's a huge leap forward in like economic status. But then you can get a college education. There's pension yeah. benefits. There's yeah. health benefits for there's retirees. So yeah, it's this the the uh, like I bought my house with the um the VA the, loan the, the VA loan. Yeah, yeah no yeah. down payment, all yeah. those things. So like nowadays, it's like you can take such a giant leap forward towards like, I mean, like improves economic status, obviously. But then it like all of the things that that uh, make it so challenging on the civilian side that. I mean, arguably in that paper lead to, lead to or not to incarceration and stuff. It's like you, you're the experience and benefits of being in the military kind of deletes a lot of those problems. Like yeah, it, yeah. it's such an incredible thing to me that like more people don't like, like right now the military is struggling with recruiting and it like, I have such a hard time understanding that when it, when there are so many people that simultaneously have such a huge economic disadvantage or or some kind of hardship that it would be that i mean it's causing homelessness it's causing like all these crazy things and it's like i mean i've never been legitimately homeless but i i've met dudes that joined the military <clears throat> and were on submarines with me that were and they were just like walking on sunshine every day like this is way better than living on the streets and using the newspaper to insulate yourself inside your clothes and stuff. like mm -hmm. it's it's not yeah. even a, a discussion. So it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I'm not trying to like paint it as all good. You know, I mean, like I said, mental health problems, physical problems, like there's a reason why after a 21 year career, I'm a hundred percent disabled in the eyes of the, the VA. And um, I don't know if all of that was directly linked to my military service, but I think most of it was, I, you can't yeah. say why you got cancer, but yeah. I don't think it was, I don't think it was cause I was unstressed and because, you know, like doing oh, yeah. a normal job every day. So, but, um, I wouldn't, I, I did it. I did it for five. You did it for 21. I can tell you. 
stress level at five was like, I'm good. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, oh good. yeah. I was, I was smart enough to walk away at five. I was quitting this job at every reenlistment until the one as a chief at 11 and a half. And even then I was trying, I was trying to, to quit. Yeah, and, yeah. but that time I'm like, if I'm reenlisting at 11 and a half years, I'm, I'm staying. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then I, that's uh, what I ended up doing but yeah i was quitting this job at every at every point all the way until i was all the way until you until you didn't until you stayed until i did yeah until i stayed too long to (laughs) to stop but it would just be silly to not get a pension well well, this has been a phenomenal conversation it's been a lot of fun um absolutely uh, really really an honor to have you on the show how can people find out about you and this uh this great podcast your website sure so yeah there you can find me all kinds of places but the best ones you can start at dgutspodcast.com uh, D guts is just an acronym for don't give up the ship. Uh, so D G U T S. So if you go to D guts podcast.com, it'll link you to everything, uh, YouTube, Patreon, all the, all those things. I won't plug those too hard. Uh, you can find us anywhere. There are podcasts. You just search. Don't give up the ship podcast. Uh, we're also on YouTube. Uh, I, I'm only, you know, like a dozen video podcasts in because of when I retired, I didn't have my face and name on it, but there's a ton of stuff on YouTube. Uh, and I plan to be a lot more active on there. So you can find us there. Um, we do, I got a clothing brand, dgutsapparel.com. You can go get some Naval Pride and Heritage gear you'll actually wear in public. Uh, that's the thing I'm pretty proud of. Um, we're on, I'm on, I'm active on Reddit, uh, Discord. Uh, God, there's probably something I'm forgetting. It's just, you can find it, Instagram, everything. It's like at dguts podcast or don't give the, don't, don't give up the podcast on Facebook, but yeah, we're all over the place, <laughs> but yeah, you can generally find us by just, just search. Don't give up the podcast on whatever platform or D guts podcast on social media and you'll find us. That sounds great. We're going to go ahead and put uh, links in the show notes for all those oh, yeah. resources. And I really highly recommend that you take a listen to this podcast uh, because I enjoy it. It's one, it's one of my go-tos. It's on my feed. I listen to it <laughs> in the car and uh, I really, I really like it. You cover a lot of, a lot of important leadership topics uh, and you get into a lot of things that I don't even get into in this show. So <laughs> I do highly recommend that you listen to this podcast. Go ahead and, and follow that link, subscribe, and you're going to enjoy it. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing all this. And uh, it's been a really fun conversation that we'll likely have to break into two. Oh, did we go recording. that long? It's the longest yes. recording podcast I've done <laughs> since I started this podcast. So yes. I'm this is great. Records. I think we'll break it into two, <laughs> but uh, this has been a great discussion. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And I'm honored that you come on the show and, and uh, we'll be having this great discussion. Hey, thank you so much for having me, John. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.